and and I thought I'd do a, a tackle one of the toughest issues in the church today, and and that is uh, this just what Clint read about. They try to trap Jesus in a question about divorce, and uh, divorce is is uh, prevalent in our world today. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, say that it's not. And, uh, and I am not going to try to whitewash what Jesus says in the scriptures, okay? So I'm just going to uh, share with you a few things of what was going on in Christ's day, in Jesus' day. Uh, in that day, this was a controversial issue. I mean, did you realize that there were two camps uh, on this, two, two camps of thought? One was by the Rabbi Shammai, and he was very strict and conservative, and, and, uh, uh, and then there was Rabbi Hillel, and he was very uh, open, uh, he allowed divorce, one uh, did not, and so uh, um, was, one was strict, one was lax. And so the, the, in the Jewish culture of that day, uh, marriage was considered a man's sacred duty. It was to fulfill God's command to be fruitful and multiply. And I'm just laying the groundwork here because Jesus is going to deal with something here that, uh, that they didn't catch all of these years. And we do that sometimes, even within not just the community of Christ, uh, but in our world today. So in, in, it was considered his sacred duty to marry. If you weren't married by the time you were 20, you were considered breaking the law of God. Man, I just made it. I got married when I was 19. I slid under the law. I would have made, made it in the Jewish community. But, uh, but they are focusing, you see, the fruitful and multiply part that God talks about in Genesis, that's the result of what marriage is really supposed to be about. Okay? We'll get to that in just a few minutes. But give you some examples. In Jesus' day, and in Moses' day, but in Jesus' day, a man could put his wife, he could divorce his wife if his supper was spoiled. <laughs> Some of you women are like, what? In fact, by, by this time, if it was so easy to get a divorce, that if the man found somebody, a woman, who was prettier and of a better temperament, he could divorce his wife. You see... They miss, they miss what marriage was all about. Why did God establish marriage? What's the goal of marriage? That's the title of the message. What's the goal of marriage? What did God have in store? You see, the be fruitful and multiply, that's just the result. That's, that's kind of a byproduct of what marriage is really, really about. And Jesus, or well, God tells us, in Genesis, that the two should become one. Oneness is what marriage is really all about. And, and of course, in Genesis, it says one flesh. That, you know, that's where the, the uh, Jews focused on. They're to become one flesh. So it all became about, it, it became all about the physical act of intimacy in the Jewish community. And that's what they built the law around. You see, they took, the, they took what God said, and then they ran with it. And listen, I, tell, I share this with married couples. I've shared it with married couples for years and years. And I'm going to keep this PG, trust me, probably PG-13. Uh, uh, but I've shared this with married couples for years in my premarital counseling and in marriage crisis counseling. That... When you come together in, in physical intimacy, there is more happening than what the world tells you is happening. The world says, oh, it just feels good. 
It's a physical feeling. No, 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 no. The reason God does that is because that is, that is an expression. It is supposed to be an expression of what you're feeling on the inside for the other. It's, that is what it's really supposed to be. And, and we think physical intimacy is just uh, the act of, of uh, engaging in sex. But it's more than that. Physical intimacy is the embracing of a hand. It's the, it's the, the, the embrace of a husband and wife. There is a lot more to physical intimacy than just culminating in sexual activity. And we've lost that. You see, that is the goal of marriage. When, when people come to me and get married, one of the questions I ask, you can ask Tori and Amber, I, why you want to get married? You can ask uh, uh, Courtney and Riley, why do you want to get married? And they always say, well, they look at each other like, well, we're in love. Really? You're in love? How'd that happen? You see, because in, in the midst of romance, that is the initial stages of love. Committed love is the goal. Committed love comes through oneness. That, that is what culminates in oneness. And, and it's exciting. It's an exciting process. It's not without its challenges. Trust me. I know. And, and I know that there's probably many in here that have been touched. Everybody's been touched. My whole fam my family's been touched by divorce. I understand it. I do. But I, wanna, I want to help folks understand that they can leave one. First of all, they can leave the guilt behind. That's Satan that tries to make you feel guilty. God's grace is abundance. We, we serve a God of second chances. And in fact, if you will turn with me to Jeremiah 33. No, Jeremiah 3, excuse me. Jeremiah 3. Jeremiah 3, and look at verse 8. Then I saw, now this is Jeremiah, the Lord speaking to him. The Lord said to me, in the days of Josiah the king, he's talking about a backsliding Israel. Now look at verse 8. Then I saw that, for all of the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. This God speaking here. Yet her treacherous sister Judith did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. And so it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. And yet, for all her treacherous sister Judah had uh, not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, Backsliding Israel has shown herself more righteous than treacherous Judah. Go and proclaim these words toward the north, saying, Return. And I want to, we're, in fact, uh, the next week's sermon is overlapping into this week's message because that's what I'm going to be talking about next week, but it's not going to be about marriage. But in that passage, what did we discover? Anybody here read that passage before? What did God do? You see, we become unfaithful in a lot of ways to one another. And we become unfaithful to God in many ways, don't we? 
when he says in that passage, he, God says to Jeremiah, she become, Israel has become unfaithful, and Judah has be, not learned from her lesson. Both of them were practicing uh, pagan idolatry. They were worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs. Now, let me sh explain something to you. The Baal was the male god. Asherah was the female god. These, this was a religion based on sexual activity. And they built these in high places, a high plain uh, outside of the city, and people would go there. This sounds like something you'd see in a movie, some kind of futuristic movie or something, doesn't it? Uh, but they go and they, they would have these temples there, and they would have temple prostitutes, both male and female. And a part of their worship was to engage in sexual activity with these temple prostitutes. And the idea was all based on uh, sex. And that's what Satan does. He takes what God has established as a good thing, and then he perverts it. And so God in this passage, he says, I'm giving them a certificate of divorce. But then, right around verse 10, he says this. Proclaim to Israel, return to me. Anybody here ever read the book, through the book of Hosea? God commands Hosea to go and marry Gomer, right? Gomer had issues with faithfulness. Now, I'm not talking about... The, the, the whole idea of this message is not about whether you're being faithful or not. The idea of this passage is, is that, of this message is that even within the church of Jesus Christ, we miss the goal of marriage. The goal of marriage isn't about uh, physical intimacy. That is a byproduct. That's, that should be an expression of the inner love that we have for one another. That's what I say in my marriage ceremony. They come here today sharing, exchanging vows of love and devotion that they have in their hearts for one another. The marriage is the start, is the commitment, is the covenant of committing your lives to pursuing this goal of oneness in marriage. Is it hard? Absolutely. It's hard. Oh, listen. Just talk to my wife. She'll tell you how hard it is. I'm not easy to live with. I know that. That's why I just do what I'm told now. Makes it easier. <laughs> Bob, don't don't amen me too strong. <laughs> no, it's not easy. And and let me tell you something, wives, you're not easy to live with either. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I have to do the altar call now. I have these cups that I bought for Valentine's a couple of years ago. One says, Mr. Right on it. The other one says, Mrs. Always Right. <laughs> now, my wife is an angel. She is. And I won't finish the joke. You're just an angel. But it is difficult. I don't care how well you get along. I don't care the common interests that you have. You have a background. You have a history. You have a family culture. And he, the husband has a family culture. The wife has a family culture. You're raised two different ways. And what marriage is is the collision of these two cultures. <laughs> and in the midst of that collision, you have to build a culture that is going to pursue the goal of marriage. And the goal of marriage is really lined out in the very first book of the, of the Bible. And it is oneness. And the oneness of flesh is, is just an expression of the oneness 
that you're to have, that you're to pursue in every area. Emotional oneness is important. It is difficult, I know, men. When women tend to be more emotional than we do. I mean, on the, on the, I'll take that back. I know some emotional men. I'm an emotional man. I mean, you stump my toe in the middle of the night, you hear it. The neighborhood hears it. That's an emotion. Trust me. Legos were born out of the pit of hell. You step on those things, yeah, that'll test your faith. But women tend to, to be more emotional on the softer side, and that's not necessarily who, who men are. We don't lean in that direction. And so when we were first married, my wife cry, I promise, to the world. That was just it. How many of you men watch a movie with your wives now, and you look over, see if she's crying? Come on, confess. I do. I do, because I want to see if it, if that's touching her. Eye. And you know the 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 feeling of continuity that I get is that she's not changed in that area of her life. She is still tender and compassionate. That brings me great comfort. You see, the goal of marriage in God's plan is oneness. What they're trying to do here is they're saying, well, Jesus, should we give, is, is it right that we give a marriage, that a man can divorce his wife? Look at what he says here. Uh, that he can divorce his wife for any reason. Verse 3. The Pharisees also came to him, testing him and saying to him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And that's a pretty accurate translation. And he answered them and said, have you not read that he who made them in the beginning, Jesus taking them back to Genesis, just like I took you guys back there, in the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. And they said to him, Well, why then did Moses command? Now pay attention. Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? And in verse 8, And he said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Now there's two words. I've underlined them in, in my scripture. Uh, one is the word in verse 7. They said Moses commanded. That's an imperative. Moses, they said, made it a command. And look at what Jesus says in verse 8. He challenges them on this, doesn't he? He says Moses permitted. There's a difference between a command and an allowance. Why? Why? What's the difference? You see, the command, if Moses had commanded that, they wouldn't have had any option. They were trying to put the blame. They were trying to see if Jesus would really know the law and uphold it. And they, they exchanged a little bit of wording. People do that, don't they? What's your phrase there, Larry? There's right and there's almost. There's truth and there's almost truth. And they were dealing in almost truth. A command makes it no option. This is what you have to do. They were trying to say, hey, it's not our fault. Isn't that, isn't that the way of the world? Hey, it's not our fault. I don't know. Gee, they said Moses commanded. Why did Moses command? Jesus said Moses didn't command. Moses permitted. Because why? And he points the finger. I don't know if Jesus actually points the finger, but he 
puts the insinuation back on them. Because of you, he permitted it. You see, the responsibility rests on us. On them. That's why it is so important that the church... I, the, let me tell you something. Do you think that this was an easy message to prepare for? Man, I prayed this week, God, if there would be any other way, let this cup pass from me. Why? Because I love you folks. I know that this, this right here touches everybody in this room. Everybody. And I know that there are those who are wrestling with what they perceive as failures in this area of marriage. I know that. Hear me. God is a God of second chances. His grace is sufficient for you to heal. But you've got to let that go and you have to understand, and so do I, that this thing this thing is bigger and more important. Why? Why? Because when I when I talk with people, I try to explain it like this, and I've done this when I was a youth pastor, talking to teenage teenagers about, you know, making sure that they keep themselves for marriage. That's important. And if I, if I had my whiteboard here, I'd, I'd draw this, this circle. And, and maybe I can do it this way. You ever seen those where the, the two become one and they lock these circles, right? These circles become uh, together. Well, we're one. We're one physically. We join ourselves. Now, when... when, when Divorce comes along, or in the case sometimes of teenagers that engage in sexual activity before they're married. Here's what happens. They've joined themselves. They've become not only one in flesh, but they've become one emotionally. Then all of a sudden something happens, a bump in the road, and they split. Now they're divided. So they find someone else, and they join to them. You see, our emotions aren't, aren't designed. God didn't design us to give ourselves to a lot of different people. That is why the world is messed up. Why is it? And I give the statistics. 70% of those who get Divorce, get remarried. Why? Because there's something within us that wants to look for that oneness with that one individual, with that special person. I mean, even the misguided country music singer Johnny Lee got that one right, looking for love in all places, looking for love in too many places. Faces. I had one guy come to me and say, "Well, you know, Pastor, if I, if I, you know, if I'm going to buy a car, I'm going to test drive it. Ladies, men, you are not vehicles. That's not the, how you go about it. That is." Stupidity on parade right there. It is about pursuing the goal of oneness. That is what marriage is really about. And so that's the question we wrestle with for the modern church. And I want you to know that I believe that God's plan will play, be played out in your life. I still like, uh, when I was a youth pastor, uh, 
I had a, a, a colleague l- listen to him. I went to one of his seminars. We, in the Wesleyan Church, we had these things for youth pastors and youth groups all the time. And, and this guy's name was Gordon. He was a youth pastor. He was quite a bit older than the rest of us. He, old youth pastors. I knew, I've known several old youth pastors. One had a youth group of about 600 up in Wyoming, Gillette, Wyoming. He was 65 years old. Guy walked into our meeting with a fringed rawhide jacket. Looked like he just got off the horse. He had pointy-toed cowboy boots, white hair, and a beard and a mustache. And he walked in. He has one of the biggest youth groups. He's wearing a bolo tie. He had one of the largest youth groups in Wyoming. Gordon, he was from the Northeast, and he had a large youth group too. And uh, I, I like what he shared. He says, yeah, one of my youth, he says, you know, I was talking about this with the youth, that you begin to pray now for who God has for you. Begin to pray as a teenager who God has for you and for your life. Parents, you need to be praying for your teenagers. That God would prepare for them a godly man or woman. And so he says, I was t- t- sharing that with the, with the, uh, my youth group. And he says, come back next week. And he goes, the kid comes up to him, about 16 years old, says, Pastor Gordon, I really liked what you said last week. And he says, I took it to heart. I've been praying every day that God would send me a woman, the woman that he would have for me. He goes, that's great. He says, yeah, I get up every morning. And he says, I'm so excited. He says, why are you so excited? He says, I went out this week and I bought a bikini. And he says, I put it on my wall in my bedroom. And he says, I pray every morning, God, send a woman to feel that. I got to give him high marks for creativity. Listen, this thing called marriage is not easy for anyone. Don't think it is. It's not easy for me. It's not easy for my wife. It's not easy for you and your wife and your It's not easy for your husband. Why do we do it then? Why do we do it? Because God has instilled within us a desire to share our life with that one special person. And for some, you're still on that search and look, you're looking. Let me encourage you, especially if you're listening today, you're single. Let me encourage you today. Let it be God's plan. Let it be God's person. It doesn't say you can't look, but do it in His way and in, uh, rely on His timing. And you will meet with success. You will. If He has somebody for you, and that's the desire He's planted in your heart, it will come about. I believe that. I believe that. I'm so thankful. That at a young age, still in high school, I made this commitment to myself. I would not marry a person that I wasn't madly and passionately in love with. And that I wouldn't pursue for the rest of my life. Now I have to confess, as a a teenage boy, I didn't know what I was saying. But I did know this. That when I, Dawn and I, stood before a pastor, congregation, and God, I determined in my heart, right then and there, long before that actually, that I was going to pursue her the rest of my life, passionately. You see, there is a part of us, when it comes to marriage, It's about the will. Do you have the will? Can you engage your will to pursue it according to God's plan, not ours? Stand with me, if you would.
Father, I thank you for your word. And I know I didn't even do justice to this, this topic. There, it, it is difficult. I, you know, Lord, I wrestled with this all week long. Had another one. Had another message, you know. Had another message prepared to preach today because I would rather preach something different than this. But I'm thankful for your Holy Spirit. I'm thankful that you keep us, keep me true to what you would have me do. Because somebody here needed to hear this today. They needed to know that there is an ideal for marriage and then there is your grace that's extended because we are frail we fall short we don't always understand the process and your grace lifts us heals us Lord there are those here today Every, every person in here, as I said earlier, have been touched by the, this thing called divorce. But Lord, I pray and ask that you would help them to leave that in the past. If they've laid it before you and sought your forgiveness, let it, let it go. And embrace your grace and your forgiveness. Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us as a church to be compassionate and caring to those that we come across in our day-to-day -day lives and that are struggling in their relationships. Men that we work with that struggle in the relationship with their wife. Lord, use us to mentor them. Use us to point them to your word. Lord, there are those who, who we work with, ladies that are struggling with their husbands. Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us help us to guide them that it's not about them, it's about God. Marriage is a triune relationship. It's a relationship between a husband and a wife. And the closer they draw e to you, Lord, the closer they're drawn to each other. Lord, I pray and ask that you would help us to be a church that is caring and compassionate and that is willing to mentor those who've been broken by divorce, that they might be healed. And those who are yet to experience the thrill and the adventure of marriage. Lord, help us to teach our children. That you have a goal for them when they get married. And that is to achieve oneness with you and with their spouse. We'll be quick to thank you for what you do in that area. Lord, I thank you for these here today and ask your blessing upon them. Lord, as we leave this topic behind and head into another area, Lord, I pray and ask you to keep our hearts open still to this issue, this issue of marriage. Keep our hearts open as we study your word. And Lord, prepare us for what you have for us next. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to close by singing this chorus, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me.
bless you and keep you and his peace be upon you. And all God's people said, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.